let me introduce our two speakers. Um, Dick Leatherdale needs no introduction, as they say, the editor of Resurrection. But what at some time in his life, he spent years, he worked for the University of London Computing Service in the days when they had a CDC machine. So I presume he thinks he knows something about it. But he brought along uh, John Fernbank, a health medical assistant, who did work for CDC. In fact, he tells me he sold two machines to that lot over there. Thank you, David. Right. I'd like to cue. Some of back to about 1963. The control data 6600 was announced in August 1963 and the first delivery was to the Lawrence Livermore Radiation Laboratories in California. Almost all Seymour Cray's first deliveries were to Lawrence at Radiation Laboratories in late 1964. In 1964 it was announced this was the fastest computer in the world and so it was. Fastest computer in the world that will replace the IBM stretch of 7030. These ways, that's what you will find if you research it. All the published documentation says that stretch was the previous fastest machine. But of course, we know better, don't we? We've heard of Atlas. <laughs> In 1969, it was replaced as the fastest machine in the world by its own successor, 7600. Just to give you a, an idea of the sheer scale of this machine, um, 400,000 transistors, and that was for a small configuration. One or two processors, or, or somewhere between 9 and 22, depending on how you, you count it. 10 megahertz clock speed, um, which was pretty fast for 1963. Um, three megaflops was the maximum possible speed. Um, that was very much a theoretical figure. As you'll see, that is uh, likely to work out a lot less in practice. Um, the Algol benchmarks that I looked up in Resurrection, well, where else would you go to find this sort of information, um, suggested this is three times Atlas power, uh, to use a, a measure that was popular at the time. And for this, you would pay something like between seven and 10,000, well, Ten million dollars each. That's about somewhere between two and a half and three and a half million pounds. A lot of money. Um, and even at that price, they sold more than a hundred. And that's just for this model. This is a machine built without compromise. This is a machine which was very consciously going to be the fastest machine in the world. It was going to answer as far as humanly possible at that time. The demand for we need a lot more computing power and we don't care how much it costs. It was targeted very largely at nuclear research um, and things of that nature, physics. Uh, universities tended to come along a little bit later and so on. What we're going to do today is to say who the hell was CDC? Where on earth did they come from? Because they are not one of the companies which grew from the early 20th century, like ICL and IBM, uh, Univac and so on. They are, uh, they were essentially a startup, and um, came quite late to the game. I'm going to look at the 6,000 series range as a whole, not just the 6,600, um, but the others as well, and see how they fitted together. Um, we're going to look in some detail at the design and the order code. And using that information, go on to say, how on earth did they make it quite so fast as they did? Uh, you'll find that quite ingenious. I'm going to look at peripherals. Now, as I look at peripherals, I'm going to use, as far as possible, uh, points of comparison, which I hope many of you will be familiar with. I'm going to compare particularly um, 
CDC peripherals with ICL peripherals, and there is a relationship here. CDC and NCR and ICL had a joint company called Computer, Computer Peripherals Incorporated, uh, which was which they cooperated in the manufacture of peripherals. Quite what ICL brought to the party, I've never quite managed to find out. But as we'll see, CDC brought quite a lot to that particular party. So we'd be able to make comparisons and be able to see where uh, the boxes were very much the same as one another. Some are present this with IBM. IBM weaves in and out of this story um, a considerable um, bad feeling, uh, which we'll cover. Then John, my colleague over there, will look at the, the successors to the 6600. Uh, generically known as the, the Cyber Series. There were several generations of those, and the 7600 in a bit more detail than I'm going to manage. Um, we're going to look at um, UK installations. Um, John has worked very, very hard on getting a list of UK uh, installations. It's not actually easy to come by that sort of information. Um, the key figure in all this is one Seymour Cray. You all have heard of Cray research, and Seymour Cray in particular. And then right at the end, whatever <coughs> happened to Seymour Cray, whatever happened to CDC, because it no longer exists, uh, and what lessons can we draw from it all? <coughs> so let's start right at the beginning. And let's make the observation of where we start in all this is that the American equivalent of Bletchley Park. During the Second World War, US Navy code breakers put together a team, a fairly small team, to build machinery to help them to break codes. Exactly the sort of thing that Colossus and the bomb uh, was done for. And at the end of the war, they decided that they didn't need those people to be members of the armed forces anymore. So that rather than break the team up, what actually happened is a little bit of a sleight of hand. <coughs> um, Engineering Research Associates was a private company, more or less owned or more or less managed by the US Navy, which would be able to take on subcontract work in the co-breaking field and in other fields. And it was hoped that they would also be able to take over um, take on outside work. Um, they, they found themselves a redundant glider factory, and the owner of the glider factory also took a shareholding. He had absolutely no idea what these people were doing because that was, that was very, very secret. And they came up with um, a proposal which was accepted for what was very being talked about at the time, a proper stored program computer. This was known as Task 13, which is why it became the ERA 1101. <laughs> <laughs> it, later, um, it later was known as Atlas, but it's not, it's not the first or the last machine to be called Atlas. However, this is the land of free enterprise, and somebody in Congress found out about this rather unhealthy relationship between this semi-private company and the US Navy, and they weren't going out to contract, and, and you know what American politics are like. Um, what happened next is that ERA fought this off, but at the end of it, they were pretty much exhausted. Um, they were taken over by Remington Rand. Remington Rand, at very much the same time, took over the Eckert Moultrie Computer Corporation, who had built UNIVAC, and the ERA-1101, which had developed a second version of it, was uh, rather like Leo 2. A second version of it was uh, developed called the 1102, with all the things that we learned in the meantime. And then, eventually, it was decided that this could actually go out on the open market, and it was, by this time, it was called the 1103. And that was, believe it or not, was called Atlas 2. Um, but by that time, it was called the UNIVAC 1103. Uh, this has absolutely no relationship 
in technical terms uh, with the famous Univac 1108, which we remember from the 1960s, uh, except the name. That is all that was kept, the naming structure. At this point, the people who ran ERA and had been bought out by Remington Rand uh, and were marketed under the name of Univac got a bit fed up. They had been used to working in a very small organization. Um, they had uh, pretty much their own way. As part of Remington Rand, which was well known for its shavers, uh, in part of Remington Rand, they had to do things properly. They had to attend meetings, progress meetings, strategy meetings, all the things that take up enormous amounts of time and effort. And everybody from ERA got fed up and they decided that they would leave. They would set up their own computer company and it would be called the Control Data Corporation. And so in about 1958, the Control Data Corporation came into being at the address in, in Minnesota of 501 Park Avenue. By adding 501 to 1103, you get 1604, which is the first, uh, first model of computer that uh, Control Data sold. They also had a prototype for the 1600 series called Little Character. Little Character still exists. Um, it exists in the Computer History Museum in California, and it's still there. Um, the 1604 was revolutionary. It was built out of transistors, not valves. But more to the point, it was very, very similar architecturally to the 1103. Uh, this seems to have attracted the attention of Univac and their lawyers, and the court case started, which lasted for something like 12 years. This is America we're talking about. So the family tree is um, pretty much that. Everything got folded into Univac. Um, control data uh, came along and, and spun out of Univac. And of course, very much later, Univac merged with Burroughs. Control data started doing quite well. Um, it took over a company called Bendix. You may have heard of Bendix refrigerators and washing machines. Um, Bendix is in fact not a domestic appliance company. It's an aircraft uh, components manufacturer. Um, quite a very high tech manufacturer. And they had a machine called the Bendix G15. Bendix G15 was designed by one Harry Kosky who had worked with Turing on Pilot Ace. In fact, the Bendix G15 <coughs> is very, very similar architecture to Pilot Ace, with the one reservation that instead of having mercury delay line storage, it has a drum. Um, control data inherited that. Control data, over the years, took over an awful lot of companies and absorbed them um, in its rise, and in its decline, it spun more off again. We will see. The man in charge, not just of ERA, but also of control data, um, something like 40 years, was one Bill Norris. Um, he must have been a pretty inspirational kind of guy. Um, sometime in the late 1980s, um, his, his time was up. Uh, they got rid of him. Um, <coughs> but uh, he ran a pretty good ship. In particular, he allowed um, he allowed Seymour Cray, who joined joined Control Data about a year after everybody else did. Um, Seymour was doing some work on the 1103 as specific enhancement for the U.S. Navy, um, and it was thought to be a good idea not to let the U.S. Navy down, since they were likely to be a pretty good customer of CDC. Um, but I, I suspect that Seymour Cray's real involvement was the fact that. Uh, he actually was, got his teeth in something he didn't want to let go. That's the first machine, the CDC 1604. As I said earlier, it was built out of transistors. Those, I think, in the background are Ampex tape decks. Um, Chris Burton will confirm that. Um, the usual wardrobe size sort of thing. Um, 
and some switches and uh, a console. Um, 1604 was designed by Seymour Cray, of course, by this time he was chief designer, and uh, was quite successful in its own right. They certainly sold quite a few of them. Then one weekend, Seymour Cray took himself off and is reputed to have designed a whole machine in the space of a weekend. This is somebody's home computer. This still exists. That's it's somebody's home computer in somebody's home. Uh, that is the 160A. The 160A is very important to us. That is, um, that is two um, CDC 160As. That is the only UK installation. <coughs> Um, that's uh, Exchange Telegraph, the people that used to do stock and share price reporting. Um, that was taken sometime in the mid-60s. Um, one of the things you'll notice is that there isn't a blooming very big cabinet uh, containing the processor. I did say, um, let's go back a bit, I did say that uh, this was quite a remarkable machine. That is the processor cabinet. Those drawers are where the processor is. For 1962 or thereabouts, John? Thereabouts. That is quite a remarkable feat of miniaturization. This is a mini computer. Before the term mini computer had even been invented. Um, really quite an astonishing feat. It came with virtually no software, and certainly no operating system to speak of, no compilers. Um, if you wanted to make it work, you had to work very hard at getting it to work. Um, I have no idea who most of those people are, except the handsome young man on the left, John Shelton, later of uh, uh, London University uh, Computer Centre uh, in Guildford Street. <coughs> well, you were asking about the 3000 series. Um, at this point, Seymour decided that he wanted to build the fastest machine in the world. And he decided he was going to build the fastest machine in the world. Bill Norris decided he wanted to make some money. Um, so the 1600 series developed into the 3000 series. Um, I say series. The 3000 series was largely a fairly disjointed range of computers that weren't even program compatible. Uh, didn't even have the same word length between one member of the range and another. Um, but this was a machine designed without any input at all to speak of for Seymour Cray, because Seymour had taken himself off to think beautiful thoughts. But Seymour was uh, <clears throat> an interesting sort of chap. He wanted to build a machine 50 times faster than the 1604. And it was at this point that corporate sloth once again attacked. Um, Seymour found himself going to strategy meetings and progress reports. And he went to Bill Morris and said, this can't go on. I cannot do my work properly under these circumstances. Um, you keep on wheeling me out to, to, to meet important customers. And frankly, this is not my job. Um, you're not making the best use of my time. So I am going to resign unless 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 you let me set up my own laboratory but which which will not be anywhere near Minnesota um, which no visitors will be allowed without my express permission and that even included Bill Norris no visitors no distractions Chippewa Falls Wisconsin happened to be um, Seymour's uh, hometown. So he had a building rapidly built and a small team of people was <coughs> assembled there and they developed the 6600 in complete isolation from the rest of the company. So August 1963 it gets announced. 1964 as we've seen <coughs> There is the launch event. And there, sitting at the console, is Seymour Cray. He looks bored, doesn't he? Um, lots of people standing around doing whatever you do at the launch event. I'm surprised there's no glasses in anybody's hand. Um, 
A machine built without compromise, that is the operating console. We'll come back to that in a little while. Some unpleasantness with IBM. Tom Watson Jr. reacted rather badly. Now, hang on tight, I'm going to attempt an American accent. Last week, Control Editor announced the 6600 system. I understand that in the laboratory developing the system, there were only 34 people, including the janitor. The janitor was famous. Of these, 14 are engineers and four are programmers. Contrasting this modest effort with our vast development of activities, I fail to understand why we have lost our industry leadership position by letting someone else offer the world's most powerful, powerful computer. Seymour Cray heard about this. It seems like Mr. Watson has answered his own question. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that something you wanted to say? <laughs> oh. <coughs> right, that is a 6600. That is not just any old 6600. That is the, the brochure shop. That's the one you will see most often when you look on the internet. <coughs> um, okay. So disk drives, some tape decks, a couple of uh, card readers, nice little card punch, operators, console, and that is the machine. Now that's a rather interesting machine. Um, most computers at this time were built in wardrobe shapes, quite long wardrobes. Here we have reached the stage where the, the distance between the components has finally become important the path lengths of the signals. So the geometry of the system is arranged in an X so as to bring the components together as far as possible. And uh, the, other th the other thing about this, you'll notice that the, uh, the remote ends of the X are a slightly different, uh, slightly different length of uh, access panel. And that's because the remote ends are not electronics at all, that's the cooling. So everything has been done here to bring the system for all the components together. This is a machine built out of silicon rather than germanium. This is a first. Um, Cray seems to have ordered a vast number, millions, of silicon transistors, millions of them, at a time when you went out and bought a silicon transistor and it cost you a couple of dollars. He ordered them in millions, and you can imagine what that did to the price. Fairchild Semiconductor must have had a party that day. <laughs> I want to look now, before we go much further on, at looking at the, the family. First generation of the family. John will cover the, the second and subsequent generations. Uh, and we, we found that the fast CPU this is the one which is the fastest machine in the world. It's a 6600, and it is in the shape of a plus. Next machine that came along a year or so later was the 6400. 6400, you'll notice, is a conventional wardrobe shape. Um, it's not a very interesting thing to look at, but OK, it's an I shape. And that's a slow CPU. It's built out of the same technology but it does not have certain features that the 6600 does, and it is therefore quite a bit slower and therefore quite a bit cheaper. Um, it's, uh, the complexity is much less. Uh, we'll describe that complexity in some detail in a little while. The 6200 is the same thing with the clock slowed down. Um, this was... Um, this is something we're all pretty familiar with. You actually sell, sell the same product under different names with different speeds. Um, in those days, it was quite, uh, quite unusual. The 6500 is a dual processor, two 6400 processors. Um, again, this is quite an interesting machine, and it's at this point I actually have a confession to make. I have never used the 6600. 6500 was the machine that I used. John has, of course. Um, 
A machine not without interest. I, in later life, I was worked for ICL, and I was asked to go and nurse made the first Dual 2970, which for reasons of inconvenience was sold to a customer in Hong Kong. <coughs> um, having worked on a Dual CPU machine, I decided this wasn't a terribly interesting use of my time and declined the opportunity, and my boss went instead. Uh, so he had a good time in Hong Kong, and I stayed at home and did the support work. Uh, now, the next point I want to make is something we're not very certain about. Both John and I have a memory that there was a proposal to build a dual 6600 processor. If you'll appreciate, with the geometry, the 6600 is already a cross shape the difficulty of actually getting the components close enough together when they have that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, packing density. Uh, we think that that was, called, that was called 6800. But I can find absolutely no evidence for that in any of the published literature. I can find evidence which contradicts that story, but it might be true. Don't take my word for it. What there was, however, is a rather more interesting machine. Um, a machine with one fast processor and one slow processor. Um, the 6700 had the two CPUs working the same jobs turn and turn about. Um, a hybrid dual is not a machine that I think I've ever come across except in one context. 19, the ICT 1908A was a hybrid dual, but it was a rather different hybrid dual because it wasn't working turn and turn about. The idea was that the fast processor would do all, all the man's work and the slow processor would run all the peripherals. This is not how the 6600 worked. The two CPUs work turn and turn about here. I confess I've never seen one. Have you seen one of those, John? No, they were pretty rare. <coughs> Finally, and this is where I say I have contrary evidence to our, our theory about the 6800 as a, a dual 66, is that we know that the 68, there was something called the 6800, which was a completely different shape, as we'll see, as a more as a C shape, um, became, was renamed before the launch as 7600. It is almost program compatible. Um, when it was realized that it was not going to be completely program compatible, um, then uh, it was at that point that it was renamed the 7600. Uh, and that machine goes several times faster than the 6600. So that's the initial range. One of the things that made the 6600 um, performance so good was that it was not the CPU was not burdened by having to service um, the peripherals. For that, what we had was something called a peripheral processor. CPU is very expensive, but more to the point, it's very fast. It is very, very good at floating points. It is really quite disastrous, as we'll see at handling characters. Um, but peripheral handling has no need for all that expensive circuitry. So what was decided to do was to actually have a, um, ten, a, a series of 10 peripheral processor units, basically to handle all the peripherals. Not just the peripherals, but also the operating system. The overwhelming majority of what we now regard as an operating system was run in the peripheral processor units. Um, Peripheral processor units are not a completely new design of computer. Ah, the 160A has come back. There's an existing system. This is actually quite a clever thing to do. Um, it wasn't particularly um, compatible at the circuit level, but what it was compatible was at the software level. And since a lot of people have spent a lot of time um, writing peripheral handlers for the 160A, you get a flying start developing your operating system. So that's actually a pretty clever thing to do. 
it's even more clever that there is in fact not 10 PPUs for each system. There is in fact only one, but there are 10 sets of registers. And that was what was called barrel operation. Let me see if I can demonstrate. There's a set of red, I have the processor, there's a set of registers in front of me. I'll deal with them, I'll obey one instruction, sometimes less than one instruction. Once I actually got that going, I go to the next set of registers, and the next set of registers, and the next set of registers. If I do that fast enough, by the time I come back, that instruction that I've initiated will be finished, and will carry on. So there's in fact only one set of processor logic for 10 sets of registers. And yet these, these PPUs, it behaves as if they're 10 quite different processors, running 10 simultaneous and different programs. It's possible to fit a second bank of up to 10 PPUs into the system if you really uh, feel that you need some more peripheral handling. The downside of all this is that uh, you can't make a system call from your main, from your user program. You can't do what we think of in Unix as a system call or in, in Windows. You can't just ride into the operating system as we do. Um, the, the means of interfacing users' programs with uh, the the operating system was that the user program will make a request in Word 1. It'll, you put in Word 1 the name of a program you want the PPU to obey and some information about what you want it to do. Generally that's a pointer to some other area in your store. And then the CPU has to cycle around and say, has Word 1 been reset to zero yet? And it keeps on doing this. Sooner or later, one of the PPUs, which is dedicated to doing not very much else other than just going around all the various jobs looking to see if their word ones are non-zero, one of them will notice. And at that point, it will reschedule the, the CPU, so the CPU goes and does another job for a while, and it will service the request by initiating another PPU, so this, this is very much a scheduler uh, program, uh, initiate another PPU to do the input output or whatever it is you've asked for. Uh, and eventually, when that is finished, the schedule will come back, reset word one to zeros, and at some time later on, it will wake up the CPU, and the CPU will say, well, what was I doing? Oh, yes, I was inspecting word one. Oh, it's zero. Okay, that must be finished now. That's an impossibly crude way of doing it. Um, but it was effective, and as so long as you're actually monitoring the, uh, the control points uh, or the jobs uh, quickly enough, rapidly enough, you're probably not wasting too much time. But uh, yes, that's been described not just by me as, as pretty crude. Now, let's look at the design, and I'm going to look really from a, a user point of view. We'll start with the store. The store's always a good place to, to start when you're looking at a computer. 60-bit word. 60-bit word, no parity. Cross off, no parity. It was said, and I'm not sure whether I'm being spun a line, John will know better than I, that the uh, parity checking circuit um, would fail more often than the core store. That may or may not be true. In a 60-bit word, you can get one integer or one floating point number. It is a one's complement machine. This is, again, quite unusual. Uh, this saves an instruction because then uh, x equals not x is the same code as x equals minus x. Um, but this gives rise to a somewhat embarrassing um, bug which a friend of mine experienced. Um, writing in BCPL, he wrote code which, in essence, uh, amounted to if true equals false. Well, true in BCPL is defined as a word with all ones in it, and false is um, a word with all zeros in it. So what we're actually saying here is um, take uh, minus zero, add plus, or subtract plus zero, and if we've got zero, uh, then that must be okay. So if true equals false, yes, it is. Um, I will tell you that the man who made the young man who made that mistake is now 
a software multimillionaire in Silicon Valley. The person who sorted it out for him is not. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing you can get in a 6600 word, 60 bit word, is 10 6 bit characters. Um, there is no character addressing. Uh, if you want to actually access a character, you have to take the word, you have to mask out the character you want, and you have to shift it down to the bottom or the top, depending on where you want to handle it. You are really very badly advised to try and run COBOL on this machine. Uh, there are ways of actually tricking the machine. They rather depend on the operands being um, word aligned, preferably exactly 60 bits long. Um, and uh, certainly it's, it's not something which uh, is likely to be uh, terribly helpful in the general case. Um, I have to say that we made that mistake. We took over a workload from a, a, a small burrows machine, uh, which was closing down, and this was not a great success. The other thing, the other point I want to make about 60-bit word um, is going to anecdote mode. I was approached by a man from the London Business School, which was walking distance across uh, Regent Park, um, who had built a Fortran program which he developed on his um, IBM 360, might have been 370, a long time ago now. Um, he was to do economic models. Economic models tend to grow. Um, it had certainly outgrown his little 360, and he wanted to run it on 6600. And he'd done all the right things. He took a small set of data to represent his model, and he ran some events through it. Um, and he, he got out the, uh, the expected results on his 360. He took that to the 6600 at Guildford Street and he ran the same data through it and he got a different result. Uh, he must have been pretty desperate because by the time he actually came to us he was waving money. Um, could we help him please? So somehow this got given to me. Uh, so after a couple of days experimentation and study I, I wrote a report. <coughs> he said, uh, if you change your Fortran program to declare certain variables as double precision rather than real, you will find that your 360 program also gets the right results. <laughs> 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 it, it has been a long, long source of wonder to me that anybody in their right mind would try and represent floating point numbers in 32 bits. Uh, this is a problem which still afflicts the industry even today in 2010, I bet. Right. <coughs> and look at the register structure. We have eight 60-bit X registers. We are probably all used to the notion that there is a floating point accumulator which is intimately connected to a lot of floating point hardware which does calculations. This is not a machine like that. This is more analogous to a set of vanilla registers which you can use for any purpose at all. The floating point calculating engines are separate. So we have eight 60-bit registers which you can use for any purpose. Um, the interesting bit of um, really the guts of, of nuclear physics calculations come in 60-bit calculations, um, mostly floating point. Um, all calculation, all the actual work is done between X registers. X registers are combined in various ways and are delivered to another X register. Um, all the rest is management. All the rest is taking stuff out of store, putting it back again, counting, uh, going around loops and so forth. All that is management. The real work is done in the X registers. It is a bit like um, the English Electric KDF9, uh, where, uh, yes, um, thank you, George. Um, in, a, in a KDF9, there is a push down stack, as I understand it, George, yes? 
and that the actual arithmetic is done between members of the pushdown stack. Yes. Yes. Um, this is the same, except it doesn't have any structure. There is not a stack here. There is, there is register to register operations doing the actual work in the same way as it does in KDF9, but without structure, without the constraint of a stack, or the advantage of a stack, depending on how you look at it. I think KDF uh, constructed so eccentric by normal standards, it's not a good model for any comparison. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it was a good model. <laughs> In addition to the X registers, there are eight 18-bit registers, B registers, which are used largely as modifiers. And it's possible to do integer calculation, but 18 bits, you'll appreciate, is not really very much um, in terms of, of being able to do proper work. So what we're talking about here is really modifier registers. And there are, in addition, another eight 18-bit A registers. Now, these have a very special purpose. They are linked to the X registers. Well, seven of them are linked to the X registers. If you set any one of A1 to A5 to a, to a value, then that value is used as the address, and the contents of that address in store are loaded into the corresponding X register. That is how you get information out of the store and into the registers. The same is true of a6 and A7, except that causes a write from the corresponding X register into the store. This is a rather eccentric way of doing it. In a way, the A registers aren't terribly useful um, as, a, as a visible entity. Though no doubt they're actually there under the covers on most machines. We have two types of instructions. We have register to register operations which take place in 15-bit operations. So for example, um, using the assembler notation, fx7 to x2 times x3 means multiply in floating point single precision mode x2 by x3 and put the result in x7. Alternatively, set B1 to B1 plus B5. Again, this is a 15-bit operation. Six bits function code, three bits each for three of the registers, making 15 bits in all. Then there are register to address. These are 30-bit instructions. Um, again, there is a function code. Um, there are two registers. And there is a 18-bit address or 18-bit literal value in the instruction. So set x5 to the contents of b1 plus that constant would actually set x5 um, to the calculated number. If you set a5, uh, that would do much the same thing, but would have the additional property of loading x5 with the contents of that calculated address. Uh, again, b registers as a modifier. So you can fit somewhere between two and four instructions in each word. If you have a 30-bit instruction in the 6600, you can span it across a word boundary. And this is an incompatibility between the 6600 and the 6400 processors. In the 6400 processor, you can't. You have to use a null instruction. But the compilers of the assembler will help you out there. You don't have to worry about it. If you want to go to one of these instructions, it has to be on a word boundary. There are no means of addressing parts of a word. So you're going to need null instruction padding. There are only 74 hardware instructions. Um, and quite honestly, each of the instructions doesn't do very much. Um, we would now regard that as a risk machine, reduced instruction set computer. This, of course, was well before the term had been invented. Uh, I have seen it suggested that RISC stands for really invented by Seymour Cray. <laughs> <laughs> the count bit 
Kaplitz instruction is a rather interesting one. Uh, the Kaplitz instruction counts the number of one bits in a 60-bit word and puts the result in a, a register for you. Um, this has uses in cryptanalysis, but almost no use for anything else, as far as we can tell. All CMOS uh, machines had this instruction, uh, right from the word go. Um, and indeed, I told it, until this week, I thought it was unique. And I suddenly received some correspondence from somebody in America who says that he worked for the British tabulating machine corporate uh, company. Uh, most of you will have heard of BTM. Um, that he was asked to design a circuit to do just that. Um, he worked at uh, Letchworth. But he wasn't allowed to go and test it. It was a special for um, an outfit in Cambridge called the Language Research Department. Um, and other people had to test it for him. He just added on this box and, and thought no more of it. Um, but he was sworn to secrecy. He was not told what it was for. He didn't know what it was for until quite a lot later in life. Um, he was um, as in the as in the the Mark One. Yeah. Perhaps now we know why. Yes. Um, the interesting thing is talking to Roger earlier today. He was saying that um, he has a list of all the 1,200 installations, the ICT 1,200 installation, and Cambridge Language Research Laboratory is not amongst them. So I think we can probably work out what Cambridge. Uh, language research laboratory was for. Right. Okay. I, 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 seem to, I seem to remember coming across that it's also in one of the uh, Intel chip sets, hey, well, the SS something. Or, I, mean, I can't, I can't keep up with Intel architecture. Just as an example, We'll go through the four trans statements P equals Q times R plus S times T. Just as an example, we'll come back to it later. Set A1 to the location Q, set A2 to the location R, will load the values of Q and R into X1 and X2 respectively. Multiply them together and put the result in X7, then pick up S and T into X3 and X4, multiply those together, add the results together, and set A7 to P will actually deliver the result back where you want it. We'll come back to that example later. The other key to 6600 speed um, was its ability to obey several instructions at once. Um, it had 10 quite independent um, functional units, each of which could be obeying an instruction at the same time. And they all worked in parallel. Um, this is a recipe for absolute chaos, except for the fact that there's an interlock, something called the scoreboard, uh, which looks at the cross dependencies between instructions. and. Uh, stops instructions being implemented, uh, being initiated before they're ready. The main thing about this is that there is an eight word buffer holding the instructions which are currently liable to be uh, executed. And what the system will do is it will go through and pick out one instruction at a time and say, right, that is a floating point multiply instruction, I'll throw it at the floating point multiply box. That is a floating point. Add instruction, I'll try it at that. But on the other hand, ah, I'm waiting for the result of the previous instruction, so I won't do that just yet. I'll go on to the next instruction. And so on, and so on, and so on. And eventually, one of the instructions will finish, and this process will say, oh, well, now I don't have that dependency anymore. I'm now free to initiate another instruction, and so on. So let's see how that actually works in practice. The 10 functional units are that there is an add-subtract unit, floating point, 
two floating point multipliers, a floating point divide, then there is basically um, a Boolean thing which, which is not really terribly um, not terribly important because you don't do a great deal of that, but it's convenient and it's relatively cheap to do. There is a, a integer add subtract unit um, in later machines that was also multiplied there. Uh, there is a, a, sheet, a, a unit which is good for branching, for jumping, and an increment unit which is basically where you do all the 18 bit arithmetic, and in, in particular uh, you do store access. Um, were individual machines made with a different set of functions? No, they're all the same. All the same. If I can go back one. No? Go back, right. One of the things which I didn't know until I started working on this talk was that there were two floating point multiplier units, and I wondered why. And then it struck me that. A floating point multiply takes quite some time compared with the floating point add or subtract. So it's a good idea to have two of those units so that you can actually do two multipliers which take some time. Um, and although you do far more adds and subtracts, they take less time all told. On the other hand, you only have one floating point divide unit. That takes even longer, but they're incredibly rare. This is a machine that's actually been well thought out. Somebody's actually done some statistical analysis and says a floating point multiplier will take this amount of time and we do this number of them as compared with floating point adds, which take less time but we do more of them, and floating point divides which take even more time but we do very few of them. And therefore we need to actually devote resources to it in this proportion. Somebody actually done that analysis. This is very clever. In my view. The scoreboarding, the interlock that takes place right in the middle of all this lot, um, is looking at the resources. Whenever it looks at an instruction, it says, is the functional unit I need for this instruction available, or is it currently busy? Are the source registers available, or are those, are, is some other unit um, Prepared, preparing to deliver a result into one of those two source registers. If it is, you can't do that instruction. <coughs> is the destination register free, or is it subject to another instruction which needs that value for the time being? And then there is a possibility of address interlocking. The possibility that you might be trying to read an address um, which you haven't yet, whose value is not yet set. And this is where the A registers come in, because you only can keep track of of uh, where you store, where you are preparing to store an address a, a value, or where you're prepared to pick them up uh, using the values in the A registers. Go back to that example. Let's see how that works out in practice. Um, first thing that we do is that we can, because we have two increment units, two <laughs> units for doing store access we can do the first two instructions in the sequence in parallel. We can set A1 to Q, set A2 to R, and set the corresponding X registers to, the, to those values. When that is finished, we can do the next three instructions in parallel, though in fact slightly staggered. We can be doing our floating point multiply as well as loading the next two, two operands because there is no reason um, at this stage why we can't do all three of those things in parallel. Beyond that, we cannot go because we haven't yet, the next instruction, for example, is going to use X3 and X4, and we haven't actually set them yet. What we'll, prob what we'll probably do next is that the increment units will finish first, and we will use the second floating point multiply unit to do the second multiplication. And only when both those two are finished, we'll be able to do the add, and then subsequently the store. That requires skills which are not very different from optimum programming, the sort of thing that you have with um, 
a mercury delay line storage and similar, where you had to make sure that one instruction uh, was nicely timed um, to come off the store uh, as the next one, as the previous one finished. Not the all mercury delay line, because that remark has to apply to all the red sacks. Certainly, if you have optical probes. Certainly applies to juices, doesn't it? But I have to say that most people on controlled aid machines did not write an assembler. This was not an easy assembler to write accurate code in, frankly, and I believe me, I tried. Um, most people would be using Fortran compilers. This is very much a Fortran machine. Um, and the Fortran compiler was capable of doing the sort of analysis that would actually give you an optimum layout. So, for example, um, that you would be able to actually allocate registers using the, the, the compilers in such a way that they didn't clash. Um, and in particular, that would be optimized across several, uh, several statements, several Fortran statements. And you would tend to not get interlocked between different Fortran statements as much as you do in the same Fortran statement. So you have a choice here, you either just hope for the best and perhaps the system will work out, or you try and optimize the program um, for parallel operation, or you can rely on the optimizing Fortran compiler. And frankly, I know which one I did. <coughs> the electronics. This is a very <coughs> early silicon machine. Fairchild Semiconductor, the initial order to Fairchild was for 10 million transistors. That's an awful lot of transistors. Um, the site called a cordwood module. Um, within, each, uh, within each of these modules, and I brought one along. Kevin, pass this around. See what you make of it, gentlemen, because I think that's an awfully well-constructed piece of circuitry for those of you who have an interest in these things. Um, it's screwed together rather than clipped together, which is quite impressive. Um, it's very, very densely packed in terms of the transistors, all of which seem to be on the edge. And um, there are many, many thousands of those in each 6600. Um, I've got a picture somewhere, I'm not quite sure. Is it the next one? There it is. That's what you're being that's what's being passed around. Um, and again, not just the fact that these things are screwed together, there are various there's screws there, there and there, and there, but they're actually screwed into the frame as well. Uh, not just push and hope for the best. Uh, a machine built without compromise. Um, they're put together in a, in a, I suppose, what we call a mainframe. Um, there are four swing-out frames in each bay. Um, at the back, everything is hand-wired. The interconnections are cut to an accuracy of one-tenth of an inch. I said earlier, we're now in a, a situation where the distance between components is quite critical. And the cooling plant is, as we saw earlier, at the extreme ends of each bay. That is what they look like when they're actually in, um, in situ. Um, you can notice as that gets passed around that there are access points that you can put your oscilloscope on. Um, there are many, many modules there. That's the front. Um, if you had a failing one, you would unscrew it and put a new one in. Whether they are maintainable, if you broke one, if one of the transistors failed, I rather doubt. Um, but of course, if you're making them up in tens of thousands, it's probably not very important. That is what the back looked like. Um, that is a mare's nest, to say the least. It was said uh, that one of the installation tests was for somebody to actually put his hand round the wiring loom and pull. And if it still worked, that was okay. That was, that was the attempt. <laughs> I think they were pushed onto spikes, weren't they, John? I don't know. Uh, they were pushed onto spikes. 
the... No, we don't. The the push pin. Push pin. Push pin, push pin yeah. I saw, I, that's what I thought. Right. Looking at the peripherals. Um, that is the console. Um, it's very similar to an ICL Opera M. Well, it looks similar. It's got two screens and one keyboard. Uh, that's pretty much where the similarity ends. Um, this is not a scanning display. This is a display where the, the electron beam that actually lights up the screen is deflected to write the characters. Think of it as a graph plotter with a pen. Um, this is blisteringly fast. Um, you can actually display the contents of store, uh, of a store location, and uh, and see it change as the program uh, progresses. In particular, it's quite useful for looking as input output buffers fill up. Um, it is also possible with the operating system to look at the various jobs which are running and seeing not only which CPUs are allocated to which jobs, but which peripheral processes are allocated to which jobs, and there may be several at any given time. Typical CDC, they made a, a silent keyboard. This was not universally liked by operators. Um, there were complaints that when you pressed the key, you couldn't hear anything, and you didn't know whether you pressed it properly or not. So CDC being CDC, um, made an additional circuit which they fitted to all their new operating stations, uh, probably retrofitted to the old ones, which every time you press the key, you <coughs> send a little pulse through an amplifier to a loudspeaker. But again, this is CDC. This is no expense spared land. There was a little volume control which was installed underneath the keyboard. And of course, rookie operators would often get used to hammering the key and hearing it click and everything was fine and then one day somebody would turn the volume control down. This caused absolute chaos. <laughs> but operators will be operators. That was ICL's version of it and it's nowhere near as sophisticated. I will say that, I haven't got a picture of it, I will say that one of the things that CDC always supplied was a vinyl covered chair with arms. This was absolute luxury in the 1960s and was much fought over by operators. It was orange, hideous colour, like that in fact. <laughs> um, you would have seen lots of those, most of you in your time. Those are what ICL called EDF 200s or 844 stroke 200s in CDC parlance. CDC was the supplier of discs to ICL for decades. Um, from, I think, the mid-60s right through to the end of the 80s. If you look at the Wikipedia entry, you will see that CDC supplied disk units to all and sundry as OEM to IBM sites, um, and all sorts of uh, different uh, things, not just, to their own, not just for their own machines. And then it was says, Inexplicably, in 1988, uh, CDC exited the disc market. Well, for those of us who are working for ICL, this is not inexplicable at all. ICL must have sold many, many times more uh, exchangeable disc drives of CDCs than CDC did itself. Um, and ICL, at that point, stopped buying them. And I suspect this is why CDC exited the disc market. Uh, what actually happened at this point was that they actually spun off um, the disc market, uh, the, the disc manufacturing unit. Um, it was bought up by, uh, I've forgotten now, one of the, it was Seagate, it was Seagate bought it up. There was an intermediate. There was an intermediate, but it was bought up by Seagate and still, in a sense, exists to this day. Right. The fixed disk unit, the 6638 fixed disk unit, was the main disk unit that most of these machines had. 175 million characters, which is not very big, but in 1964 or 65 was pretty, pretty large. Two channels, 128 recording surfaces, six read and write heads 
per surface and 192 cylinders. Transfer rate was 1.68 megabyte or mega characters a second. And this is what it actually looked like. This is the diagram from, from the manual. There are two spindles. Um, the left hand and the right hand spindles are got, each got their own motor. The actuating units for the heads are in the middle. Um, all the heads move together and they move outwards and backwards. That's actually quite well thought out too, isn't it? Because the dynamic forces which shape this around tend to be balanced out if you do that. Um, the top half and the bottom half are completely independent. Um, each have their own channel, each have their own head controls. Um, not as you'd expect the left and right, but the top and the bottom. But the interesting thing is this bit at the bottom. There are six each. In between each pair of discs, there is a head assembly. And in the head assembly, there are six read right heads facing downwards and six read right heads facing upwards. At any given time, one head assembly, one arm, is active, and three heads, three facing upwards, three <coughs> facing downwards, are also active, which means that as one bit goes by, you actually transfer six bits. Moreover, since the, the heads all address different tracks, there are six times less cylinders, effectively, than you would expect. So although I've said there are 192 cylinders, actually, effectively, there are only 32 positions for the heads to be in. Um, I had a word with, uh, with Hamish earlier on. Uh, my, my impression when I saw this a couple of years ago is you just think what you could have done with the CATS unit on one of these. Um, kind of a, a fantastic transfer rate. But there's an awful lot of heads, and these were not cheap. Um, the very earliest 6600s had a Bryant disc. Um, but these were developed fairly quickly after the initial launch. Um, and they were, again, by the standards of the time, pretty fast. I will say that they required, if they were ever powered off, it was a disaster. Um, the, the tolerances were such that if they were ever powered off, um, they had to be polished before they could be put back into service. And there was a, an, a, an arm which you could actually put onto the surface of all the discs, or a series of arms, to polish them, and it would take about an hour and a half to get the machine back in service, just to get to, just to get the uh, the disc up to the point where there was the guarantee there was no dust to affect the um, to affect the heads. Um, in about 1972, you will remember that there was a certain amount of industrial problems with the miners. Um, there were power cuts. Um, at that point, we were running both Atlas and the 6500. And power cuts on Atlas were a disaster. Um, we had had our, our machine powered on, I think, since something like 1964. And it had not been switched off ever. Uh, it was known that if you switched it off, you would probably um, find an awful lot of failed circuit boards. Um, one day, the power went off because the local electricity board had to, had to share the power cups around with the minor strike. Uh, we all gathered in the reception area and we sung songs and we pretended it was the blitz. Um, <laughs> when the power went back on again, uh, the two sets of engineers, control data's engineers and the Atlas engineers, were very much on their metal. Atlas took two days to get back. Control data engineers took an hour and a half to get their machine back. When it happened the next day, Atlas took about 10 hours to get back. Control data took an hour and a half. After about the fifth time, Atlas took about 10 minutes to get back. And the control data machine was still taking an hour and a half. <laughs> um, had we been known that all we had to do was to switch it off a few times and all the dodgy boards would, would reveal themselves, we would have served ourselves an awful lot of electricity bills on Atlas over the years. And indeed, we did start switching it off at weekends after that. But uh, 
there weren't many weekends left in his life, sadly. 512 printer. Um, two things I'd like you to notice about this. One is that the sloping top. The early 512s had a flat top. Um, this is one of those machines, uh, one of those printers, where when you ran out of paper, the hood went up so that the operators could see that it was out of paper and they'd be, the hood would be ready for them to change the paper. Um, it was discovered fairly early on, apparently, that this had the nasty side effect of covering the output in coffee. <laughs> <laughs> An ingenious solution to this problem uh, meant that the, uh, the, the coffee problem went away. If you smoked the top, you didn't have the coffee problem anymore. Um, that's what it looks like inside. That may be familiar to some of you. Um, that's very similar to the ICL LP4B. That's an ICL LP4B in case you needed reminding. Um, it is not the same machine as the LP4B, but it's very similar technology. It is a train printer with um, a rotating train of, uh, of prints, uh, print slugs going around and hammers coming up from behind the paper. Um, both of them use very much the same technology, but the ICL one had 160 print positions, whereas the CDT one had 136. But notice, this, is, this was known externally in ICL as the LP1500, but was known internally as the LP4B. And think, if there's an LP4B, there must have been an LP4A. Well, the LP4A didn't exist. Uh, as far as I know, it never escaped into the wild. It was an interim uh, printer which was used during the development of New Range, um, and consequently photographs of it are very, very hard to come by. Except I found one. There it is at the back there, sloping top and all. And that is an, a CDC 512 printer, bought OEM, not very many of them, perhaps a dozen or two, um, and they were used during development. And I didn't realize that this was one and the same printer, though I did actually notice that they were very similar. I didn't realize it until an engineer took the covers off one day, and there it said on a little patch, control data incorporate. I thought, ah, oh, I know what this looks like. Yeah. And if you wanted to uh, compare one with the other, there you are, the LP4A at the back there, and the, oh dear, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. <laughs> terribly the wrong way, sorry. Right. There's the LP4A, there's the printer. Right. And there's an ICL card reader, a new range card reader. Very similar to the Control Data 405 card reader, but not mounted in the same plate. Now, I've used both of those quite extensively, and I have to say, but from an operating perspective, I prefer the CDC one. They're pretty much the same sort of speed, um, but the flat bed of the CDC one doesn't give me the feeling that one day I'm going to drop a pack of cards all over the floor. And that's really why I think the difference is. The CDC one does have the unfortunate problem, however, that the speed through the read station is such that when it comes out of the read station, it stops very suddenly and your, your punch cards develop a nasty little, um, nasty little bruise on the leading edge. And after you've been through about 30 times, you've got to go down, down into the basement to your old horrorous reproducer and uh, get a completely new pack of cards uh, because this damaged them quite badly. <coughs> Plastic edge card, luxury. <laughs> <laughs> um, the card punch is a little gem. We had been used to um, a big card punch that looks as if Herman Hollerith himself had uh, uh, designed it. And I'm increasingly, I come to think that he probably had. Um, this was the standard ICL or ICT card, re uh, card punch that made a horrendous amount of noise, ground its cards out very slowly. This is a card reader which uh, 
you can see uh, you put cards in one side, they get punched uh, column by uh, row by row rather than column by column, come out the other side. Um, they come out very quickly, they come out quietly, and it takes up hardly any floor space. This is only about three feet high. Uh, a little gem of a machine, uh, much better than anything we were used to. Um, tape transports are not particularly interesting. They're pretty much the same as the IBM and the Unibat tape transports. Um, that particular transport, it was eventually fitted up with, years later, uh, was fitted up as a group code recording transport. Um, and ICL started to buy them, very small numbers, um, and they ran at a speed of uh, 1.25 megabytes a second. Um, we only sold them to one customer, it was the DHSS in Newcastle. It had a requirement which couldn't actually be met by transfer from disk. Um, later on, we, uh, we started buying CDC tape transports, the GCR mode tape transports in quite large quantities. And then Fujitsu came along and they put Fibosh on that as well. There was also, a robotic cartridge system. This is in 1976. Uh, the yellow things you can see there are the cartridges. Uh, ICL again had this in its product plans for VME um, around that, around the late 70s. Never quite got around to doing it, which is rather a shame. A decade later, um, with a different piece of hardware, yes, they did fit robotic cartridge systems in, but. This would have been quite useful in, in the late 70s. Uh, that was largely um, not for use with CDC machines, but for use with IBM 370s, where it was essentially, functionally, the same thing as the IBM 3850, bit of nasty uh, copying there. Uh, The last piece of uh, peripherals is um, something called extended core store. <coughs> extended core store is essentially relatively slow core store with a very long word length of 600 bits. It is used as a substitute for disk. It's what we later came to call um, later came to call solid state disk. It's what we now call memory stick. But in in the late 1960s, this was a big deal, a very big deal indeed. Is this the point at which you start, John? Yes, but then we very good. No, 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 no we, we just carry on. machines since ooh, at least 30 years ago, so uh, excuse me if I'm a bit rusty. So what we uh, want to do is uh, look at the, the family of computers which uh, were spawned by the, uh, the 6600. We could, out of, out of interest, say, follow the Cray line or look at uh, supercomputer development in the CEC, but for the specific purposes of this uh, meeting, then we'll continue down the machines with the similar architectural structure from uh, to, to the 6600. Sorry, there were five members of the family. Uh, it wasn't that family, but the sudden amount of blue from Marge's hair appeared in these things. The, the first machine to uh, come after the 6600 and uh, the various other models in the 6000 series was a single Cray design, the 7600. Uh, as Dick says, there was a uh, possibility of a 6800. I've actually seen photographs of the 6800 and a complete sales presentation, but it was an empty cabinet with 6800. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the specific difference between the 7600 and the 6600 was in the, uh, the use of pipelining for instructions. The memory, so the, the CPU cycle time was 27 and a half nanoseconds as opposed to 100 nanoseconds and it had 
nine functional units rather than ten, uh, only one multiplying unit, but because of pipelining, uh, the, the extra speed was, was uh, quite considerable. So the, uh, the overall speed increase was somewhere between a factor of five and a factor of ten, depending on the uh, particular problem which, we, which you were running. <laughs> <clears throat> the Cyber 70 series, which uh, then followed on, was in fact uh, a pretty much a badge engineered 6000 range, but with uh, slightly uh, pretty that cabinetry and as standard some extra instructions for the lower machines, particularly uh, for Cobalt performance. Then there was, there was a thing called the Compare Move Unit which allowed a uh, slightly better uh, execution of, uh, of COBOL. That was not available to the, uh, the, uh, the Cyber 74 or 6600, but uh, despite what Dick says, uh, I know people used to run uh, COBOL jobs on the 6600 at SIA because it was fast. It may not have been particularly efficient, but at least uh, they got the job done. Cyber 70 was still a 60-bit word machine, as was the 7600, but uh, as time went on, there was a need for uh, to, to, to get somewhere with a 64-bit machine, but that was going to take quite a while. So there was a, uh, the Cyber 170 series came along, which were essentially the uh, same as the Cyber 70 and the 6000, but with ECL circuitry and CMOS uh, error, error uh, correcting memory. Eventually, the Cyber 180 did come along, and uh, this was a 64-bit uh, virtual memory machine. But owing to uh, delays in the operating system, there were a lot of different models which started out by simply emulating the 60-bit machine. And uh, there were a number of generations of this which we'll uh, look at a bit later. Uh, finally, uh, the last machine ever to be produced by CDC in this range was the Cyber 2000. And we'll look at the, uh, the performance characteristics of these various machines in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, going to Google Images and getting these pictures is uh, a little bit tricky, because if you actually uh, type in Cyber 180, you're quite lucky to get a picture of a pair of skis. <laughs> <laughs> So if we look at the, uh, I don't know if you can read this at the back, but the, the timeline of the, uh, these various machines actually spans 30 years, which is quite uh, incredible for a, a single design to, to, to last quite so long. Uh, starting in, the, uh, in 1963 with the 6400, the 7600 in 1968, the Cyber 70s in 71, and then a whole raft of machines, which for various the 170s, 720s, 820s, and, and so on. And then the, uh, in 1984, a machine called a 990. Uh, this had been a project under development for quite a long time. It had the code name Theta. It was a bit of a unicorn. Everyone could describe it, but nobody had actually seen one. <laughs> but it did appear, and it was a... a a very uh, effective machine. The 7600 uh, was very similar in many ways to uh, the 6600. You see the, the, the modules um, about the same size but slightly wider, containing lots more components. And this was indeed uh, one of its downfalls in that it had uh, a bad reputation in terms of reliability. Um, these problems did get sorted eventually, but uh, not immediately. And that's uh, close up and personal with a 7600, some of CDC's finest customer engineers, and look at those trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in terms of performance, uh, there are all sorts of uh, misleading ways of comparing these machines. Um, these, I believe, are LINPAC benchmark numbers uh, compiled by Jack Dongara. 
Uh, so it shows a 6600 as being 0.48 megaflops, whereas one could get maybe one megaflop uh, or even three megaflops out of, out of 6600. So as long as you use these as relative indicators, then you can see that uh, the 7600 was um, five times a 6600. And ultimately, you've got uh, the Cyber 2000 uh, able to perform at a, at a rate of 32 megaflops on this benchmark. Friends of the family, who bought these things? Uh, well, it's good to have friends in high places. And the Flowers Report, which some of you may remember, uh, was uh, a very interesting document to read. I'm uh, not sure if you can read this, but the, um, the members of the uh, committee were uh, Flowers, Black, Church House, Collinge, Roberts, and Seaton. And they came to a number of conclusions, which you probably can't read, but they, they talked to the three, three uh, English company, British companies, uh, which I believe to be ICT, English Electric, and Elliot Automation. They also spoke to CDC and IBM. They came to the conclusion that anything less powerful than a KDF9 would be purchased from British suppliers, but anything more powerful than a KDF9 would have to be purchased from America. And they reckoned there would be 10 to 15 such requirements within five years of January 1966. They reckon there was a special case at Edinburgh for a, uh, a multi-access system, and that indeed did become an IBM installation. But uh, the last one, I think, is quite cheering for a sales manager within CDC. The choice is between, for, for Manchester and London, the choice is between a 6800 and a 36092. Hmm. <laughs> Dick, I believe, will uh, go on later to mention <laughs> what this might be, but uh, we will see now who did in fact buy these machines in the UK. And in order to do this, I sent an email just over a week ago to a group of people who I thought could help me with this. And it went around and around and around and it kept coming back with more information added to it. And if I printed it out, it would probably be as long as a piece of wallpaper. But <laughs> And no one seemed to be in total agreement as to exactly who bought what and when. So it's a little like uh, herding cats. And as the week went on, I became even more frantic. <laughs> 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 so the first 6000 series machine was bought by SIA at the Bureau of uh, Computer. And that was installed in <coughs> 1968. And a number of these machines went on to be bought by universities and uh, another service bureau, which uh, is where Dick got his experience with the 6500. The very last 6600 to uh, get into use in the UK was at the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting in 1976. I couldn't believe it when I heard that they actually used that. but. Uh, it was used to develop their model on before the, uh, the, the crate was installed and ready. The first 7600 went into the University of Manchester in 1971, and it had the unique characteristic of being front-ended by an ICL 1906A. The second one went into the University of London Computer Centre the next year, and a number of years later, uh, 7600 went into GCHQ in Cheltenham, and that was subsequently upgraded, uh, added to by, by a second machine. The Cyber 70 was slightly more successful in terms of numbers, and in fact, uh, the, one of the first customers was Sun Life Assurance, which was a great departure from selling to universities and uh, research establishments. But they were somewhat unique in that the machine that it replaced was a KDF9. <laughs> so, 
so as you can see, there are a bunch of uh, heavy engineering uses and university uses of this Iber 70. The 170s similarly um, to uh, a number of uh, largely similar organizations, although uh, we were starting to get more commercial uh, customers for, for these machines. You know, like companies like the BAT and uh, Ford Motor Company. But by far the most successful range was the, the 180s and its various guises. And uh, the single biggest order we ever got was for the, um, from the Central Electricity Generating Board for uh, the control systems for the national grid. They ordered 17 960s. I'd love to have been the salesman who was uh, <laughs> sitting on that order, but uh, there we go. Imperial College, just up the road, had a number of machines from control data, and the last one being a 930. And the most powerful machine that we sold in this range was to Sun Life in 1991, and that was a Cyber 2000. And shortly after that, the lights went out on control data and no more machines were sold to anyone. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. The 6600 was a remarkable machine. Do I have the microphone on? 7600 was a remarkable machine. Usually it was front-ended by another 6000 series machine, but as John said, at Manchester, for probably political reasons, a 1906A was called into question. When I first discussed this with John about a year ago, he said it was an absolute disaster. Um, I had a friend who was working on the ICL side of that project, and he thought it was a triumph. I don't have to, well, I don't have, to have an opinion that I wasn't there. I've got a foot in both camps, which is slightly uncomfortable. Right. We left IBM with Tom Watson throwing his toys out of the pram and having a little paddy. This was the time when uh, the industry was made up, so it was said, of IBM and the Seven Dwarfs. Um, this was the era of nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. This was the, the era of um, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. IBM was notorious for, Fred, for spreading fun, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. The result of uh, Tom Watson's little paddy is that the in fairly short order announced the 36092, which John's mentioned in passing. It was announced it would be faster than the 6600, um, and consequently people said, Oh, I think we'd better have one of those. You don't know very much about these CDC people. They might not be here in 10 years' time. Oh, we, we'll be all right with IBM. You can rely on IBM. Um, they stopped ordering the 6600 for a while. <coughs> and 1964 turned into 1965, and 65 into 66, and still the 36092 did not appear. 1965 turned into 1966, there's still no 36092. Um, by 1967, IBM announced that it wasn't going to uh, deliver something called the 36092 at all. It would deliver the 36091 and the 95. The only difference between them is that the 91 had a core store and the 95 had a plate with wire store. Um, these <coughs> were delivered in 1967, they were sort of almost competitive with the 6600, but by that time it didn't matter because the 7600 was just around the corner and that went several times faster than the 6600. Um, but this had had a very damaging effect on CBC, so they decided that they would have a go at the, um, have a go at IBM with an antitrust case. Uh, they alleged that uh, IBM was guilty of uncompetitive business practice by announcing a machine that they never had any intention uh, of marketing, just uh, from the intention was as a spoiler to stop CDC 
taking orders. That case went on for four years. Towards the end of that four years, um, CDC's lawyers had, uh, had um, a lot of access to I I IBM's internal documentation. Uh, a court ordered that IBM turned over any documentation which CDC was asked for. And, uh, I remember, I have another confession to make. My uncle worked for IBM. Uh, he was working in Paris at the time and he was told me that he was called to a meeting with the IBM lawyers and was told that if he was uh, asked to produce a document, then he had to produce it. Uh, on the other hand, Paris is an awful long way from Washington and he needn't be too enthusiastic about it. Um, <laughs> at which point, the Department of Justice also got in on the act and they started an antitrust case against IBM as well. And CDC discovered a series of books called the Grey Books. <coughs> the Grey Books were all about uh, the 36092, which not only had not existed at the time of launch, there had no plans for it, there was no uh, idea what technology would be used for it, nobody knew anything about it at all except in the imagination of somebody in the marketing department. There was no such machine, there had never been any such machine, and although there was an attempt to make such a machine, it was completely unsuccessful. Um, for this um, $100 million settlement in CDC's favor was made, which included IBM's entire service bureau operation, cost-free. Um, IBM presumably reckoning that the days of the service bureau that they had known and been supporting since the 1930s uh, were about to uh, about to go down the pan. Nonetheless, um, that brought uh, CDC very much to the fore in the service operation. Part of the settlement was that the database which CDC had been accumulating was to be destroyed, which was rather a shame for the Department of Justice because they thought they were going to get their hands on it. The Department of Justice case rumbled on until 1983, uh, when uh, President Reagan decided this was not a terribly good idea and put a stop to it. Uh, and there it has stayed to this day. But IBM have been down the antitrust uh, lane many times over the years, and that was simply a rather large uh, penalty for them. We now come to the successor machine, uh, completely incompatible with anything that's gone before, the 6800. Um, this was very much Seymour's, um, Seymour Cray's baby. Uh, in the 6600, he had been very much helped by a man called Jim Thornton. Jim Thornton has written a book about the 6600, which shamefully I have not completely read, but it's largely about circuitry rather than about architecture. Um, Jim Thornton was sent to work on a vector machine, which was at the time called the Star 100, and later became the Cyber 203 and 205. These are fascinating machines in their own right. Not terribly successful, but enormously interesting and well outside our scope. But Seymour Cray went off on his own and decided he was going to build the world's fastest machine. Uh, it was going to be called the 8600. It wasn't compatible with anything very much. Um, and for several years, he toiled away. Uh, he got a machine which worked sort of, uh, but it had cooling problems. Um, it, didn't, uh, it didn't work for very long at a time because he simply could not get the temperature down um, to a point where, uh, where it would work reliably. And he went back to Bill Norris and said, we need to start again. We need to actually start on the hardware all over again. And at this point, Bill Norris said, enough is enough. We can't afford to have two lines of uh, development going. And he chose, arguably incorrectly, you might think, um, the vector machines as being a better bet for the future. Which point Cray left CDC. Um, as we know, it's a company called Cray Research. 
and in 1974 the Prey 1 was launched. This is not the same thing as the 8600, but it is quite close. The Star 100 and its successors were not enormously a success. And Cray Research became really the world's leader in supercomputers. Bill Norris had not entirely abandoned uh, uh, Seymour Cray because CEC took a 10% shareholding in Cray Research. So they got some of the benefit of it as well. But the timing, frankly, was not fortunate. Um, towards the, the end of the 1980s, um, the middle of the 1980s was very much the rise of cheap small computers which could be used in quantity to produce with a little effort uh, much the same sort of performance overall. Uh, certainly the use of a large supercomputer to uh, service the requirements of many different users was no longer economic. It was economic for doing um, certain types of nuclear calculations, which is where we came in after all. Um, but the end of the Cold War also had an effect on funding for that sort of research. And basically the market collapsed in the late, late 1980s. Um, as John has mentioned, CDC essentially ceases to manufacture uh, computers in 1989 or thereabouts. The disk drive operation went to Seagate, as I said earlier, um, as CDC grew, it took over other companies, and as it shrank, it uh, floated off companies. The Commercial Credit Corporation, which was basically CDC's leasing arm, um, was spun off. It grew to be Citigroup. Citigroup was is one of the uh, largest merchant banking operations in the States, or at least it was when I wrote that slide. <laughs> in 1992, CDC broke up altogether. Um, Ceridium Corporation basically took away the service activities, basically um, the stuff that had come from IBM and had been developed and changed over the years. And Ceridium Corporation still exists. Uh, my last job, God help me, was for EDS. Um, EDS, like a lot of employers these days, has an employee welfare system which is outsourced. It is outsourced to the Ceridium Corporation. Imagine my surprise when I looked them up and found out it's none other than our old friend CDC. The other part of the operation, basically hardware, such as it was left, uh, but still some of the software, went to a company called Sintegra. Sintegra was taken over by, uh, you'll never believe this, by British Telecom. And it was British Telecom's um, technology arm uh, and marketed under that name until about four or five years ago, where they suddenly decided that they no longer wanted to use the Sintegra uh, brand. But nonetheless, uh, <coughs> CDC broke up into those components and split off all sorts of operations over the years, uh, and it no longer exists. <coughs> it is still possible to run 6,000 series programs. There is an emulator. It's a commercially available emulator. It was at one time available as freeware, uh, but Sintegra, I believe, um, weren't terribly happy about the fact that the operating system to which they had proprietary rights uh, was being passed around and being used for nothing. So you have to actually pay for the emulator and for the operating system that comes with it. It is essentially uh, an emulator for a 6400 and runs on a fairly modest computer at about the same speed, or a fairly modest PC, uh, at about the same speed as the 6400 would originally have to run. <laughs> Eventually, Seymour Cray once again leaves his employer, Cray Research, in 1989. He sets up the Cray Computer Corporation. And this time, his machine is the Cray 3. It has 1 to 16 processors. All of them are highly pipelined. It's based on gallium arsenide, burst in something called fluorinet. Now, I've never heard of it either. 
They sold a single four processor machine. The company went bankrupt quite quickly in 1994, at which point Cray starts up yet another company. But before he got anywhere very much, um, I'm afraid he perished in a car accident in 1995. And that is the end of Seymour Cray. But I did promise you, what can we learn from all this? One of the things I think we can learn from it is if you want to design the fastest computer in the world, you have to think very fundamentally about what you're doing. I place some stress on the X registers, and it is only with the use of those X registers that you can actually achieve the sort of parallelism in floating point operations, at least, that you can with the 6600. If you have a single accumulator, then each instruction tends to be dependent on the result of the previous instruction. IBM's mistake was in trying to um, build a machine which was competitive with the 6600 from an existing architecture which was not specifically designed to be the fastest computer in the world. It was designed to make them lots of money from small and medium businesses. This is not at all the same thing. So my view is that if you want to design a really spectacularly powerful computer, you start from scratch, not from what everybody else seems to do, and that is actually build a faster something than what you've already got. So that's what I take away from all this. You may take away something different. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for listening. Um, the, the ICL 1900 was somewhat similar in that it had eight registers, um, which could be manipulated in um, sort of independently in the same sort of way. Um, and um, when I first started, there was somebody who was doing some um, nuclear physics type calculations on that machine. Um, and he very carefully arranged that um, he was doing a, a floating point arithmetic between one pair of X registers and then next between another pair and next between another pair um, because a sort of unpublicized side effect of the, the 1900 was that in fact it was faster if you could separate your, in a, in a similar sort of pipeline way to the one you were describing, where while it was finishing off doing something between um, X registers 1 and 2, it could then be doing something between 3 and 4 independently. Interesting. Um, but the, the, the the floating point unit on 1900 was a single unit intimately attached to the floating point accumulator. You couldn't do, as I understand it, um, and John French at the back there will confirm this, I suspect, um, you couldn't actually do um, proper floating point arithmetic between X registers without involving the accumulator. Would that be right, John? I think so, yeah. The, the X registers were just integer arithmetic. They were just integer, 24-bit integers, yeah. Mm. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, but anyway, okay, so um, maybe I misremembered and, yeah. and he was talking about um, it, the, the various um, arithmetic operations that he needed to do as, as backup to the... Uh, it would certainly be possible to overlap in exactly the same to, way to um, the integer operations, and most of the computers that I've used have had many integer <laughs> registers in exactly that way. Uh, and yes, the hardware could be developed which would actually overlap those operations, but not usually with floating point. Not that I've seen anyway. Can I interpret if the X registers were, were uh, index registers? Atlas had 120. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> the 1900 X registers were index registers. Uh, Atlas, Atlas had 120, 120 yeah. X re index registers. I'm just trying to make a point that yeah. perhaps they had the idea of doing my fast sheet yeah. floating. Right. Craig did acknowledge a debt to Kilburn uh, and that was in particular, though what, quite what for, I don't know, Simon might like know. Yeah, um, perhaps it was asynchronous um, or um, pipelining. I know um, at a seminar given by Frank Sumner, who spent some time over at CTC, 
uh, he was impressed by the way that Seymour Cray said that parity was for farmers. <laughs> <laughs> when he wasn't wielding a, a soldering iron, he did write the code. And when the 6600 was first built, he personally wrote an operating system which ran in the peripheral processes which you uh, described. And the machine I was working on, a CERN at that time, was delivered with that operating system. But meanwhile, the Great Control Data Corporation was supposed to be preparing the proper operating system with the name of uh, CIPROS, which uh, never really seemed to see the light of day. Well, while uh, we were waiting for the corporate operating system, I had to maintain uh, the so-called Chippewa operating system, which was seen this version. Now, I dare say we're all ex-programmers in one way or another, and you'll know there's nothing more excruciating than looking at somebody else's code <laughs> or having to maintain it really is uh, pretty horrid. But when I looked at Seymour's uh, code, it was the most beautiful code I've ever seen. Um, it was written for the peripheral processes and uh, it was written in Octal with the occasional comment card and even kind of reduced programming to its simplest form. Nothing kind of clever, just some kind of engineer's approach to program where every single thing was done in the simplest possible way. And I think that's probably how he came just to sort of get it dump it straight out of his mind into uh, option. I think it probably was, but for a while it was called the, uh, the Chippewa operating system because it was based there. Scope, and, scope uh, was held to be an acronym for Sunnyvale's Compendium of Programming Errors. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But I said that the Sipros thing was really rather clever. Well, the Sipros thing was involved. I do remember my boss at the time visiting Chippewa. Uh, he must have had one of those special permits and he couldn't find Seymour. And eventually he saw his feet sticking out from under a computer. <laughs> and uh, there he was. Mm. But uh, I've always had an artist code, and I would like to uh, lose this opportunity to mention it. Thank you very it's much for that. Very aesthetically satisfying. Until um, about 2003 or thereabouts, I was dealing with a firm called CDCO in Hastings, CD company. Uh, which is now called General Dynamics, or an offshoot of General Dynamics. Uh, is that part of the same company? Is it an offshoot or, or not? I don't know. It's a computing devices company in Canada. Yeah. Uh, it's a subsidiary in Hastings, and it was part of the Okay, that needs to go on, on one of your slides then. Thank you. Sir. No. Thank you. Um, I have a more today. Oh, if we wait for the microphone, then we can all hear, and I'll, I'll bring it along in a second, George. Um, I worked on the uh, SIA system uh, quite for quite a long time with the Bureau there. Um, I'm picking up that issue right on the I'll come across here. Um, and uh, I came across the other day a document written by my wife who couldn't come today in 1968, and it was a reminder that that machine was one of the first to introduce um, online uh, terminals that you could actually sit at as opposed to just putting the stuff through on the card yeah. reader. Um, and uh, this is a, it's a wonderful document. It has um, uh, a glorious flowchart which says things like, is your file still in the machine? If so, and the reason for that was, I noticed that in fact the files were retained for only 20 days. It was a wonderful marketing arrangement. You had to turn up at least every 20 days, otherwise your data will just disappear. Um, and the editor itself was, um, uh, had one or two interesting quirks. For example, if you've made a mistake, you could issue the command rewind, um, and what that did was to lose all the edits you've made so far, and you had to start all over again. One a brief technical question, though. Um, you mentioned that the 6600 range 
uh, had integer arithmetic for 60 bits. I seem to recall that the multiply and divide only gave you 48 bits. Uh, it, the rumor being that it reused the uh, part of the floating point unit to do that. Um, and I seem to remember that we had trouble. We tried to write a, a character handling library in Fortran um, to uh, get over some of the difficulties you mentioned. And we found we couldn't because we couldn't get at the two top uh, characters. We had to drop down into assembler to do that uh, because there was some sort of restriction on the uh, uh, integer arithmetic actually really only being 48 bit, not 60. Unless I completely misremember that, which of course I may have done. That's correct. That was yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Hello? Oh, yes. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> have I one? Yeah. Uh, I'm George Davis, and my first paper of distinction in this matter was sitting next to Seymour Cray at a BCS dinner the first time he came over to introduce his idea. And I attended one of my lectures, and they seemed to be very concentrated on how to dispose of the heat generated uh, by the, the, the enormous number of electricity thrown through the circuits. Uh, and subsequently, I had to comment uh, in picture of French on my uh, impressions of having been shown around the 6600 um, installation in Paris. Um, I want to comment on one of the things being said about other machines. Uh, people seem to have quite the precision always of the things about CDC, uh, but I won't do that. I'll leave it. Sorry, Yeah, just a couple of words. Um, first of all, I'd like to mention that I did work for Control Data in the States starting on Easter Monday in 1964, which may or may not relate to, but. I'll come back to that. And uh, I was there for about two and a half months, two and a half years. And during that time, I worked for Control Data in Palo Alto. And one aspect of this whole story is that um, Palo Alto was where they did the software for this 3600 series and the 3200 series. And the, the, the software for the 6600 was all done down in Los Angeles. I do believe that, as Dick said, I think the, the basic development was done in Chippewa Falls in Minnesota because that's the kind of fellow Seymour Cray was. He, he was a real hunting, shooting and fishing kind of fellow and he wanted to stay, which was, I mean, Chippewa Falls, as I remember my geography, was quite a long way away from Minneapolis, but uh, that was the way he wanted to work. And, and, but the, the point that I'm trying to make was that I, I found it very strange that Bill Norris he got this operation going in, in Palo Alto, this 3600 series. There were quite a lot of us there, two or three hundred, working on the software for the 3600. And, and there was this little outfit in Los Angeles, which I, I don't know, is much smaller, I don't quite know how it was, developing the software for the 6600 series. And I remember very distinctly one of those uh, insights that one got into the American way of life. Uh, meeting some chap, it must have been in, um, in, in um, Minneapolis on, when I was up there doing something other. I thought it was British, maybe somebody would tell me his name. But he was in charge of the software development in uh, Los Angeles and he tried very hard to persuade me to go and work for him. The reason I didn't was that uh, if you ever live in Palo Alto, the Bay Area, you have the most utmost contempt for Los Angeles, which you regard as being a, a dreadful dump, and, and nobody wants to go there, and I, I certainly didn't want to go there, so I never did. But, I mean, as I say, the main point is, how did Bill, Martin, Bill Norris, what was his thinking, a fairly small company, in actually setting up this the 3600 operation, and, and in direct opposition, and no cooperation <coughs> as far as I could see, whatever, the 6600 operation, because, the only reason I can think of was that clearly Seymour Cray was an extremely bright man, a genius, well known to me. That was why um, he was hired, obviously, and they basically gave him a free reign, carte blanche, do what you want, even though the opera other operation was, was, was uh, to, to a certain extent, in, in, in the status of the times. It was fairly, 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 3600 and 3200, fairly successful operation. That's just a little bit in addition to what... And Dick's very excellent, actually. I spent a while 
programming from, I think, the very beginning of 1970 to 72, the ULCC 6600. Uh, you made a passing reference to a COBOL or to COBOL on the 6600. Um, I suspect sometime during 1970, uh, a COBOL compiler was delivered. From memory, it was a COBOL 68 compiler. And I had a vague knowledge of COBOL and thought it would be rather smart to take a PhD, piece of PhD code I'd been working on in Algol 60 uh, and teach myself COBOL um, by translating this into, in, into uh, COBOL, which I proceeded to do. Um, there was a delightful lady who I think was Joan Payton, if I remember rightly, at ULCC. Uh, a lady with a, an American accent um, who was responsible for looking after this. Well, she and I became extremely close friends because the COBOL 68 compiler was an unmitigated disaster. Uh, even somebody teaching himself COBOL um, could find bugs in it without any trouble. S several years later, um, there was a new COBOL compiler produced, um, not, a, not a version of the first one, uh, that was a real joy to work with. That was a wonderful compiler. But this, this, I'm sure it was a 68 compiler, was quite awful. And she sent endless bug reports back to uh, where, wherever it had come from. Uh, and it produced virtually no effect. I suspect they decided to abandon it. Uh, the second compiler well, was thoroughly useful there. The, the software was interesting. Um, somebody from CDC, would, or perhaps from somewhere else, would come along and configure your operating system for you, and after that you were on your own, basically. Um, they gave you the source tapes, and uh, if you had a problem, uh, you, if, you, uh, if you wanted to do something the operating system wouldn't do, you wrote your own bit of the operating system, uh, which is what John was doing for a while, John at the back there was doing. Um, people would pass around operating system fixes. I, I do remember one which said you should apply this patch if the card reader is more than 40 feet from the CPU. <laughs> <laughs> um, it got to that level. It was very much self-help organization. Um, the other thing in passing that I, I John Shelton, who you saw up on the screen a while ago, told me this story. The, uh, at Chippewa, as you, as you know, nobody was allowed in without express authorization to Seymour. But eventually, a customer um, found out where this place was. Um, and the customer was experiencing certain problems with, with the job that he was trying to get through. So he went there and he knocked on the door. And he knocked and he knocked and he knocked. And eventually, the door was answered by Seymour Crazy. Yes, what do you want? And, uh, the man explained that this program, which was obviously correct, um, wasn't getting the right answers. The Seymour Cray opened up the folder, looked at it for a few moments. This program is rubbish. Actually, it's not what he said. Um, he turned on his heels and closed the door. The customer still outside. <laughs> <laughs> Treat me. Yeah, yeah it's. Uh Quite interesting. I worked for Control Data Institute, the training branch of it, briefly before I realised I got thoroughly behind the eight ball and was getting more, less and less aware of what was going on in the real world. Um, sorry to any educationalists, but uh, that was simply training. What was very interesting, though, was from what I've now discovered, this business about the IBM service bureaus. We were um, teaching people how to program in COBOL and assembler and strange thing called plan. So we, we got our machine time from various places. Um, and you take your COBOL decks down to the sort of CDC bureau, which really consisted of a card reader and a printer. And you handed them over and you had no idea where they were going to run until the listing came back and it told you that it was happening in Reichweik or it was happening somewhere in the States or is it all around the world almost. Um, and this is obviously where, where it came from, the fact that CDC had been given the IBM um, Service Bureau as part of their settlement, which I, I didn't realize at all. 
the, the other interesting thing was that at one point it became too expensive for Control Data Institute to use Control Data's bureau service. So we went out and bought time from somebody else. The problem being that Control Data's IBM Service Bureau ran DOS, and the other guys we bought machine time from ran OS. And we then had to learn a whole new set of JCL to get the damn things to work. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was quite interesting. And, and also, just as I left, of course, they started introducing the interactive Plato education system, which I think was a very important development from control data in terms of bringing that sort of thing forward to a practical implementation. At, U at URCC, there were some, quite a few uh, remote um, job entry terminals, 200 user terminal, and something that they never seemed to get to work properly, which was a trend terminal system, which is a sort of cluster of VDU terminals working on something fairly similar, same uh, overall data protocol to the uh, 200 user terminal. Can you say any more about those? John? <coughs> well, I don't familiar with them, I don't recognise the name. Well, I recognise the name Tredden. Um, I think I came across them when I was working for Barrick, which is a little later. What was it? It was def definitely the same um, overall uh, bit of basic hardware. Was it? Just a word about um, exchangeable disks. Um, you hadn't mentioned, but I'm sure you know, that um, CDC, uh, when they were flying these or EDS 60 type of range of things, were beginning to get extremely expensive. And um, <coughs> although inside ICL it was called second sourcing, it really was that they were getting them so overpriced that they were in bed with a firm called Ryco at Staines. Yeah. And um, we had to interface their machines, which were not that much different, but uh, supposedly to the same interface, but nothing ever is. Um, and we sold a considerable number. And I think perhaps one of CDC's downfalls on peripherals, and perhaps other areas, was it's overpricing when it thinks it's got a, sing a captive well, customer. It came back from that, John. Um, um, you're thinking of the EDS 30, I think. Um, and well, I know that ICL sold quite a few systems with CDC's EDS 30s, but then stopped and started to buy dry codes. Yeah. Um, one of the problems that I recall from that is that the cartridges were not compatible. They were supposed to be. They were supposed to be, but they weren't. No, what if you smooth, you know, you did the cat size carefully, it took a long while. <laughs> I was intrigued to, intrigued to learn that CTC 6600 was first sold to the nuclear industry or, or the research there. And it was um, a heavily optimized Fortran compiler because they had lots of hard sums to do in the nuclear business. And it occurs to me exactly the same thing applied to DEC when they were introducing the PDP 6 and the PDP 10 at approximately the same sort of time. And what, 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 same thing about the um, how whether the CDC approaches a completely different uh, market to, to deck or, or, or was it the same market? Were they actually competing or? And there was a different order of magnitude of performance, wasn't it? And PDP 10 was, I suppose, about the 1904's worth, something of that sort. Well, it could be, yes. It's, it's just that they seem to they seem so it, it, into the same market. They were, it, it, yeah, um, but the deck were largely selling into departments rather than into corporations. How is that so? Yes. As I, I, Kevin would know more about this than I did. Yeah. Kevin? I don't know much about the PDP 10 in particular, but you're right about the way that deck pitched the uh, sales. Was it department level rather than corporation level? So. Oh, there are much more affordable machines than the yeah. Yeah, see, it's not. Now everyone sells to people. Okay. Yeah. Now everybody sells to people. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Are we all drunk? Would you like to go home? No, no. <laughs> Can't go home yet. <coughs> Dick and John, thank you very much. I'm, you brought back to me um, so many names of things I've totally forgotten about. And I, I, I cannot help but make one remark. Because, because you listed all these universities that had these CBT things, and of course mine wasn't. We had Big Blue, after an Atlas. And what I always admired, what was on the other side of the fence, the, about the CDC, that they made such lovely machines. The actual outside of Lovely blue and grey glass. Whereas big blue was boring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed to both of you. Okay, while I've got you here and before you run away, some announcements, if I may. Uh, you have these bits of paper on the back, we'll start with is the notice about the annual not subscriptions. Um, I'm going to rewrite this. We don't have subscriptions to CCS, but we do invite donations to our emergency fund to suggest that 15 pounds is about the right amount. It's entirely up to you if you don't donate or not. Um, but you will be getting what they've got, those notices. The next talks coming up um, in March, 18th of March, we have Kevin Murrell and Tony Fraser talking about the Decatron computer, which is one of the newest CCD, uh, CCS projects. Um, then we had a change of program, because uh, the 15th of April had been changed, and now we have people from IBM Hursley talking about kicks. Uh, yes, about yes. the whole software story at Hursley over yeah. 30 years, with a particular emphasis on kicks. Right, which is uh, quite a new addition to the program, which should be very interesting. Then finally in May, God willing, <laughs> Pegasus is working, we shall celebrate uh, the 50th anniversary of that Pegasus as they're here in the museum. Uh, we are quite optimistic in the CCS that it will be working by then. Um, then we have more programme I won't mention coming in the, later in the season. Uh, particularly rather interesting, I think, is the origins of the computer by Horst Zusa, with what relation to? Some. 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 It's been a good turnout today. Well done. Thank you very much for coming.